Okay, so our uh, last talk of the day will be given by uh, Tristan Bureau. Um, take it away. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Liz. And uh, thanks, Jenny and Rafa, for the invitation and the great workshop. Um, I'm gonna also talk about course grading. Uh, so to keep up with the with the theme, I'm gonna talk about it in a slightly different context and that I'm not gonna be using uh, machine learning potentials. I'm going to be using good old uh, molecular mechanics potentials for these coarse grain models, but I'm gonna be um, sort of blending into machine learning model to try to uh, look at the exploration of chemical space and, and, and whether the two can be, can be useful. Uh, let me first uh, thank the people I've had the chance to work with uh, with the years and, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, and, then, and then collaborators and funding. I'll get back to some of the people who, were, uh, uh, who worked on a particular project I'll talk about today. And, and so the first premise I want to talk about is uh, on this multi-scale modeling plot that, that is pretty traditional and that we see often um, in, in trying to uh, sort of uh, describing processes that have uh, a large dynamic range of length and time scales. And um, that means that we need methods that have, that can, that, that can address these different lengths and time scales. And then the promise of multi-scale modeling is that they can sort of merge them together and sort of uh, marry them together uh, in a way that we can have uh, uh, numerical solutions uh, to try to, to, to tackle uh, the, the large ranges of length and time scales of these complex systems. What I'd like to discuss is that uh, there's, there's potentially a, a third axis that's uh, relevant here if you're thinking about uh, exploring chemical space or compound screening. Um, that'll be the, the, the number of compounds or screening, sort of a, a data scale of the number of compounds. Um, and that's relevant if you think about, uh, um, well, if you're going to do a handful of experiments, you might be able to do this by hand. And so that will give you a, a couple compounds. Uh, but of course, you want to scale this up, then that's going to start becoming uh, impractical very quickly. And so you're going to have to work with more automated solutions. And so, so this is a picture of uh, high throughput cell assay and, and, and that's traditionally used in, in drug design. And that allows you to scale up the number of compounds you, you work with, and then that enables you to work with uh, more expressive types of machine learning models. Um, and so what I'd like to argue today is that uh, multi-scale modeling, in particular coarse graining, is uh, relevant and, and useful in, in the context of exploring chemical space, in that some coarse grain models are capable of systematically reducing the size of chemical space. And, and so if this blue box here is, is some uh, abstract representation of chemical space, uh, you can use some chemical, some coarse grain models to reduce it. And of course, if you can reduce it, that means that you can explore it more efficiently. You can sort of uh, sample it more efficiently. And so that's, that's, that's the premise of the talk today. Um, so, uh, Jenny already gave a, a, a primer on, on parameterizing these coarse grain models. They're uh, mainly, so I'm going to be talking about models that have this type of resolution. So uh, you can think of these beads as, as, as functional groups. Um, and uh, there are two main ways of parameterizing coarse grain models. One is top down and one is bottom up. So uh, Jenny talked about the bottom up way, which is from microscopic information. So from, from this, uh, from this multi-scale plot, you start from the bottom and you go up, uh, starting say from atomistic simulations and then doing something like force matching. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, top-down models, which go the other way. They start from uh, the top and go down. And uh, they typically start from phenomenological information or sort of large-scale physics. Uh, and then you try to encode uh, that information into your coarse grain potentials. Um, and that typically leads to this introduction of, of these bead types. So these are like atom types, but for these uh, coarse grain beads. Um, and so it's the same idea. They just have different chemical flavors. Um, and so that they're rep that's represented by these different colors here. Um, and so if, especially, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about the top down side. Um, and, and so you can, if you, can, you can try to do this. Of course, if you want to do this in, a, in some sort of a high throughput way, you have to automate this parameterization uh, of these coarse grain models. Uh, so that's exactly the same as in any other type of modeling. You have to, to, up to, to, to automate the force field parameterization step. Um, and so you can do this, for instance, this is for a uh, so-called martini force field, which is pretty famous in the biomolecular field, um, where uh, you start from, you try to encode a certain amount of physical chemical interactions uh, that's contained in this, in this chemical group. And then uh, you pick the B type that, that best uh, sort of reproduces a, a coarse view of, of these physical chemical interactions. Think about hydrophobicity and think about charge in particular. 
Um, and then, so this is something that you can easily build a surrogate model for, um, and then you can you can you can do this in a way that you can automate this step and make it really uh, really quick and, and simple. This actually runs on a web browser. Um, and, and so the idea of coarse graining has been around for a long time, for many decades, and, and, and people started doing this for protein folding actually back in the day, uh, decades ago. Um, and a lot of the attraction to it was, was the reduction in, in the structural mapping, and that, that gives you a lot of uh, mileage in, in having simulations that are a lot faster, and you can explore conformational space much faster. Um, the reason we use it here is um, not in the resolution of the structural mapping, but in this introduction of B types. And because you have fewer B types, you can uh, realize that two molecules that are uh, chemically similar, say they, they're just like one, one functional group may have a, a, a different modification, um, will collapse to the same coarse grain representation simply because there are few B types. And so that introduces a degeneracy in this, in this in, in chemical space, and so it's going to shrink it down. Um, and so that's why these transferable coarse grain model reduce the size of chemical space. So that's and that's only true for these transferable coarse grain models, not the chemically specific coarse grain models. Um, and, and interestingly, you can actually scale how much it uh, reduces the size of chemical space by playing not with the uh, resolution, but by playing with the number of B types. And so that's how you scale how much you reduce the size of chemical space, whether you use few B types or more B types. Um, and so you can use this to uh, really push how you, this uh, some sort of a high throughput screening experiment, but using computer simulations at the coarse grain level. So you, you're working with these coarse grain uh, representations, run coarse grain molecular dynamics um, at high throughput, and then you can try to get insight from the sort of large databases of free energies and such. And so these are examples from mostly from membrane permeability, with, uh, which Chris talked about this morning. Um, and you can get a number of, of insight from this, uh, from looking at functional groups or trying to learn equations or uh, even on the right here trying to uh, look at the physical chemical interactions that would lead to uh, changes in the uh, uh, thermodynamics or the phase of a, of a lipid membrane. Um, what I want to talk about today is, is a, more of an application uh, in the context of trying to find uh, small molecules with particular properties and, and the problem is motivated by a biological problem. Um, of uh, looking at uh, mitochondria. And so mitochondria uh, are the powerhouse of our cells. They, they provide the uh, ATP, they produce ATP, and that a lot of it happens in the inner membrane. And the inner lipid membrane is interesting that it has a very uh, peculiar uh, lipid composition, and it's rich in these lipids called cardiolipins. So I'll, I'll show you what cardiolipins look like in, a, in, one, in the next slide. Um, and, and people want to find out uh, how much cardiolipin there is in, in, in these membranes uh, for mainly for two reasons. One is it tells you something about the aging of the cell, and then it also can link to some pathology. So things uh, so, such as Barr syndrome, for instance, which is some sort of a, a, a muscular weakening of the heart. Um, and so there's been a, a need for molecular cardiolipin probes. Um, and, and so there are, there's been a few um, contenders in the field uh, in, in, in the last few years. And so we wanted to try it out with, with coarse grain modeling. Um, so the cardiolipin molecule looks like this. This is here. Uh, you're, if, if, you're, if you've ever seen a phospholipid molecule, uh, that's the more traditional one. It's made with two acyl tails here. Uh, cardiolipin, as you can see, has four of them, so it's more of a large beast of a lipid. Um, interestingly, if you, if you look at it more closely, you realize that cardiolipin really looks like two of, of these uh, phosphatidylglycerol lipids that are sort of uh, covalently bonded together. Um, and so, um, one of the uh, one of the probes that exists in the field is this uh, NaO molecule, so NaO compound here, um, and that that is a good probe for cardiolipin, but it lacks specificity that it also uh, binds strongly to uh, PG to this phosphatidylglycerol. And so, what we'd like is to find a probe that binds to one but not the other. And you can imagine it's it's a hard problem because cardiolipin and PG look so similar. So it's really an entropic problem of having these two chains uh, tied together. 
Um, and so the framework is of the following. So we're going to try to reduce the chemical space as much as possible before we start sampling it. And so uh, I think that this number has been thrown around already. So if you think about uh, the, 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 the space of small drug-like organic molecules, probably on the order of 10 to the 60 or more. Um, because we coarse grain, uh, we end up with only about 10 to the 5 representations. And that's because of this uh, use of these B types in the coarse grain model. So this is a, a purely physics-based reduction in the size of chemical space here. Um, and the next step is that it's still too large if we're going to run alchemical frangic calculations uh, on every single compound, so that's still too much. Um, so we're going to use a, a, an autoencoder uh, to reduce this. Uh, this is a little bit of uh, uh, Alagomes Bombarelli, if you'd like, uh, where we train a variational autoencoder on the coarse grain representations to build a small dimensional latent space. And here we only have 16 dimensions. And we're going to work in that space trying to optimize for this uh, cardiolipin selectivity. So this is an active learning cycle. Uh, here, this is, this is quite, uh, uh, that's, that, that's not new in that uh, here we have a set of free energy calculations that we run for a particular coarse grain compound. We're going to run calculations both for PG and for cardiolipin, from which we can derive a delta delta G, so as, as, a, as a relative uh, stability between the different membranes of inserting the compound in these different, in these two membranes. Um, we're going to do this for a number of compounds. And then from this, we're going to feed that into our, uh, our VAE, our variational autoencoder. And what we'd like is to predict the delta delta G in the entire latent space. And so we're going to use a Gaussian process regression model uh, in the latent space to predict selectivity for each point in the latent space. Um, and because we, we start with something like 70 compounds to begin with, we have uh, a, a, a very sparse description, uh, a very sparse data set to begin with. And so we're going to have a, a, a relatively poor first estimation of this surrogate model for delta delta G. Um, and so what we'll do is you'll use Bayesian optimization to then suggest to us what should be the next experiment. So what should be the next compounds we should then simulate uh, in an exploration exploitation scheme. And then these will then be fed back into the molecular dynamics running alchemical free energy calculations again. And then we keep going. We've done this for about 70 to 100 compounds per cycle. And there were, I think, seven cycles that we ran. And so we had about 500 uh, compounds for which we uh, ran alchemical calculations in total. Um, and so this is. Uh, on the, on the left, this is a, a showing you here the convergence of uh, in the latent space. So these points are all the, uh, uh, the, the selectivity value, the delta delta G, um, at the different cycles for these, for these uh, different compounds in each cycle. Uh, so these are all calculated. They're not predicted. Um, from this, we can also identify the top coarse grain compounds, so the top performers, the one that had the best selectivity. So here they're shown here at these type of graph type uh, thingies, but so they're coarse grain molecules. Um, but then we'd like to get insight from this. So, so the last step was to uh, take these and then try to build a lasso regression model on the subgraphs uh, to try to extract which sort of sub patterns uh, had the most impact for or against selectivity, to try to get a bit more of a of, of chem a physical chemical insight. Um, of course, these B types here do not tell you what atomistic chemistry to use. Um, and so what one thing we can do is some, build some sort of probabilistic map from functional groups to B types in a forward way. Now you can uh, take a large data set of compounds, something like the GDB, you could coarse grain them all, and then you can see what functional groups lead to a particular uh, B type. So that's, that's fairly easy to do. Um, and what we end up with are uh, certain sets of design rules for, uh, for, for compounds to be selective, things such as the compound should have a charge, so that, that, that it would, uh, which makes sense because it wants to target the, the, the lipids, polar heads. Uh, it wants to have hydrogen bonds. It wants to have hydrophobicity also enough so that it, it stays stable at the interface of the membrane, so this also makes sense. Um, and you could say, well, job is done, except that, uh, of course, and I think that's been raised before, uh, we, if you want to pro propose a certain compound to be experimentally tested, then you'd have to probably synthesize that compound, and that's a problem. And so instead, what we do is we start from a chemical vendor database, we're going to sort of filter it, and then try to see which compounds sort of most agree with the design rules that we've uh, identified. And so this is something we did with this uh, MQL database that provides actually a very nice uh, API to, 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 um, to, to provide, uh, to, to, to um, obtain uh, the, 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 all the, the compounds that they have, they can, they can sell. 
Um, and we then end up with uh, 22 compounds we've selected that, would, that, that were then uh, tested experimentally. So these 22 that are on the left, these are in vitro experiments, uh, and, and these are Lardan uh, measurements. They look at the uh, change in fluorescence, the fluorescence probe, so they need fluorescent groups, uh, and they look at the change in fluorescence between different membrane environments. So there's cardiolipin and then uh, the, the other PG baseline. Um, and basically there are three, this is a bit difficult to read, but there are three compounds uh, for which there's a significant difference in this uh, change in fluorescence, which would tell you that in vitro, uh, these three compounds would be selected, uh, would show selectivity. Um, what's remarkable is that uh, we also teamed up with uh, Heinz Ozivac in, in Frankfurt, and they, for one of these compounds, they tested it, it actually for, no, most all of them, they tested in vivo, but for one of these compounds, they also saw uh, a activity in vivo. So this is in, 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 uh, in bacteria, where they measured the oxygen consumption rate, and you can see that when adding this compound, there's a reduction in the, in the consumption rate. So there's activity, and so this is definitely binding through this cardiolipin. Um, so that's really promising the context as we started from coarse grain simulations and then end up with a compound that is actually uh, active in vivo. Um, and so I'm at the end of, uh, so this, this, this is uh, trying to uh, try to hopefully motivate it a bit the usefulness of multi-scale modeling and coarse graining in the context of uh, exploring chemical space. Um, and, and you can think about this as sort of creating a third axis for this multi-scale modeling problem that, that typically only has time and length. And then the, uh, and, and, and the benefit here is that you reduce the size of chemical space, which makes it easier to you know, uh, learn structure property relationships or try to gain some insights. Um, and last, we've had a, a nice commentary by Matteo Aldeghi and uh, Connor Cowley uh, uh, that were, uh, wrote a nice commentary on our, on our article. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks. Okay, great talk. Um, I already see questions in the audience, so I'll go to those and I'll save mine for the end. Thanks, uh, very nice talk. Um, you said in the beginning that you're going to use a top-down approach and I didn't understand what are the phenotypic data you're using because in the end you're using atomistic simulations. So isn't it a uh, bottom-up? Uh, no, so we didn't use atomistic simulations. Um, mm -hmm. You. So the um, the delta delta G's the delta G's they're all coarse. This is all coarse grain. So these are all coarse grain alchemical fringy calculations. So mm -hmm. there are no atomistic simulations mm -hmm. there. And what what were the phenotypic data then you used? The what? Sorry. The phenotypic data you mentioned that you're going to do the top down using phenotypic data. Phenotypic. Well, in the beginning you said you're not going to use um, atomistic data, yeah. but you're. We're gonna use phenotypic data. Right, right, right. So, so this is a, a this is basically a Martini model. Uh, so, of course, ah, grain Martini model. Okay. Right? Okay. Uh, it's actually not the Martini model because we work with fewer B types to, okay. to compress even more the chemical okay, space. No, it. um, but it's you can think of, think about the Martini model. Okay. Uh, and and we did this because you know it, it's uh, it was easier to work with these types of complex biological problems than ah, setting okay. it up as a structure based coarse graining mm -hmm. problem. And um, what was the assay you used to verify the, the results of the calculation? I didn't get that. Uh, the cell, I'd have to look. I don't know. I'd have to look. The cell assay, I'd have to look. Ah, okay. But I can look it up. So as far as I know that Course greening has problems with specificity, right? So I can see the point where you reduce the chemical space, but when it comes to specificity, then your B types can be like more than 18. They could also be like a hundred, for example. So going forward, not regarding this, this topic, but going forward, what do you think about specificity and course greening? Because that's a really painful topic to look after, so yeah. Yeah, so I see it as a feature, not a problem, uh, in that you, I've, you know, so you can think about the, you know, the sort of a landscape of chemical space, and then you'd want to like, uh, look at a particular target property you're interested in, right? This would be like this delta delta G, for instance. Um, and then of course you wanna have, you wanna use a very, 
uh, accurate model to have accurate values for a target property. What we're doing by coarse graining is sort of really sort of smoothening this chemical space and then trying to identify uh, possibly promising islands. And then the idea, of course, would then be to again go back to an atomistic resolution and then check this. Here, you know, did this with some with some experiments, but then you'd want to do this in a multi-scale way by going back to atomistic simulations to go back to specificity. So the coarse graining is not made for specificity, as as you as as you rightfully point out. It's really made for a, a zoomed out type of quick scan of the chemical space. I I missed. I didn't understand how you compute the free energy. What what are free energy calculation in, in the case of a coarse grain? How yeah. do you do that? So, so this is these are very traditional thermodynamic integration calculations. So we set up a. Uh, this is exactly what you would do in atomistic simulation. Uh, you would do thermodynamic integration to get the uh, uh, difference in free energy of, say, the compound. Let me see if I find a picture here. Uh, no. Do I have? Yeah, here. So you look at the, you use thermodynamic integration to look at the difference in free energy of insert, of having the compound inserted in the membrane or not having the compound. And then we look at, we do the same thing in the two membranes and then uh, subtract them to get the delta delta G. So this is exactly what you would do atomistically, except we do it with coarse grain simulations. Is it surprising it's predicted? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it, uh, so yes and no, because these, I mean, so particularly this coarse grain model, Martini has been uh, parameterized to get these things right. So it gets a lot of it wrong. It gets a lot of things wrong, but it tends to get the thermodynamics of insertion uh, roughly accurately. Maybe a little bit philosophical question. One active molecule out of 22, is it success or a failure? Yeah, I think it's pretty good. No, what is your rate? Well, I never we never done, you know, free energy lipids, but typical typical virtual screening, you know, metcam binding affinities, you know, thirty percent is typical success rate. Right? Twenty, you know. Then that means we're competitive with physics-based models. I think that's great. <laughs> I don't understand. If Martini works, why why didn't you just use Martini? What was the advantage? Right. So Martini works. Uh, um, Martini has more B types than the one we used. So it has something like uh, 14 neutral B types, and then we're using five. And so that means that the size of chem so it, it, it will uh, lead to a larger chemical space because it will tend to, it will not collapse molecules as much. Um, because you have more B types, so there's more, uh, it, it, it can, uh, it's definitely a speed up, yes. It's definitely a speed up because you you shrink your chemical space and so it's going to be faster to explore chemical space. Uh, it's, it, that's hard, actually that's, so that's hard to say. I. Uh, That's hard to say, but it's 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 going to be orders of magnitude, but it's hard to say how much because we haven't done it with Martini. So and then it's like an equilibration problem, right? a convergence problem. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, this method is really interesting for me, but I'm wondering what was the criteria you used to choose only a selection of the bits of Martini? Because uh, the families of bits are parameterized based on these octanal partitions. So you are also somehow biasing you, the properties that you will observe. Could you explain a bit of how, what's the logic behind the choose of the bits? And the second is, what was the logic to do, use the encoder in the, so, so mm -hmm. you go from, I guess, the regular size of the molecule to 16, how you do this encoding, if you can. Right, so um, the, so the way we optimize for these five B types in the model is based on trying to um, uh, uh, sort of 
cover as much of the physical chemistry in in small drug-like molecules. So we'll take we'll take the GDB and then we'll try to uh, um, uh, describe as much as possible um, uh, and reproduce the variety in chemistry along this hydrophobicity axis. Right. So Martini is based on hydrophobicity, and we use that. And that's because you know we hypothesize that uh, hydrophobicity is going to play a big role here. Of course, if that's wrong, then you know nothing's going to work. And so that's sort of the physics the physics assumption we put in there. Um, and as for the second question, why we used uh, not to encoder is to reduce the size of, of this chemical space we were working with, uh, because we still had 10 to the 5 compounds and we wanted to reduce this further. But I, we haven't done it without it, so I can't give you a, you know, I, I can't tell you how hard it would be without it. Uh, and a related question, you use the Martini 2 or the new Martini 3? Because in Mart <laughs> Right, so this is a, yeah, this is a, so no, this is based on Martini 2. Because the time Martini 3 did not now with Martini 3, you can add the uh, charges, partial charges in the model. So that will open a new part of chemical space to be explored. And I'm not sure if this plays a role in this type of finding. Uh, so how could you encode in that case the, the charges inside the, this encoder part? Uh, so we have charges, we have charge beads and we have different charges. Uh, mm -hmm. So as you know, as uh, in, in, in Martini 2, you had uh, either zero, one, so yeah, integer charges. Uh, so you, you, you could then try to um, generalize this a bit for, for uh, uh, partial charges. I haven't thought about it too much. Um, uh, it's an interesting question, yeah. I don't have a so I don't have a ready-made answer for this. Uh, 